Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 16 of the Gorilla Social Work Podcast. This episode, as always, is brought to you by Alpha Counseling and Treatment, who is the largest and most respected provider for justice-involved clients in need of sexual offense-specific treatment services. Alpha is also a JRI-certified agency providing moral recognition therapy and substance use disorder treatment to justice-involved clients. You can be confident that the treatment you will receive with Alpha will keep you out of the criminal justice system. Alpha clinical professionals are trained and certified in cognitive behavioral interventions for sexual offending. This evidence-based program teaches participants strategies for avoiding sexual offending and related behaviors. The program places heavy emphasis on skill-building activities to assist with cognitive, social, emotional, and coping skills development. Visit their website today at utahsbesttherapy.com. Or you can call them directly at 801-645-5455. Alrighty, on the podcast today, we are going to have the mighty Arlo Gagestein. I think I said that right. Arlo Gagestein. Cool last name. Uh, he's, he's the owner and founder of Competitive Edge Fitness in Ogden, Utah. So he came on the show to talk a little bit about how he got into fitness, some of the world records he's actually pursuing right now, and the importance that physical activity plays in mental health. So without any further ado, we will get on with the interview with Arlo Gagstein. <laughs> That's so loud. Yeah. Watch, pick that up. Like, put your yeah. headset on. Do that again. Yeah. I'm going to put that on there. It's recording right now. <laughs> that's well, so well, loud. That gave me anxiety. Later, good. <laughs> yeah. That, that's the official uh, introduction of the podcast now. A gigantic 72 pound gorilla kettlebell just got us started. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we are recording? Yeah. That was, that's on there. I want to put that in there. Yeah. Oh, that nice. was, that, that, good. That, good. That's yeah. where we'll start. Yeah. It's where that. With gorilla the, with the mighty Arlo Gagenstein, Gagenstein. I think yeah, you an there's not an N. N. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gang Gagenstein. Don't, don't gag on it, dude. Don't don't, don't gag on it. Gangnam style. Gagenstein. No, I'm not gonna make. I'm not gonna make the usual mistake and make fun of his name. There's okay. nothing to make fun of. Nothing. What could that's possibly? That's right. That's right. Gagenstein is a very normal last name. <laughs> it's a strong name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It means against the rock, actually. So. Does it? Does yeah, it really? really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, How did? Uh, I wonder how that starts. Like you're just like if you're back in the day. And you just get it, you know, what What should our last name be? Oh, yeah, Against the Rock. And then, like, you threw some dude's dead body against the rock, right? That's what happened. Like, I think we were probably just between a rock and a hard yeah, place where, the whole time. <laughs> it's probably where they live. Our entire the lives. I like my yeah. version better, but... Uh, I do, too. Yeah. I like to think of your ancestors as total badasses. As well, why. naturally, but... <laughs> Throwing dead bodies against rocks seems way better than we're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah your, your ancestors were definitely Vikings of some type. Oh, yeah. Some type. For some sure. Type. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, for sure. For sure. We, I was, I was uh, really looking forward to this one when we had reached out to you and kind of talked to you a little bit about this. So, um, well, tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like what's your profession? What do you do? Um, so I am a strength and conditioning coach and I own competitive edge fitness in Ogden. Holla. And- that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I've owned the gym for 13 years and that's pretty much what I do. I do personal training program design. I'm also a licensed massage therapist oh, and nice. do sports massage. So. Yeah. They're not the fun massages though. No, 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 no. The useful ones. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I they're, go to him every time before a marathon. Functional massage. Yeah. yeah. They're not the kind of massage you'd buy a gift certificate for. <laughs> More of a punishment. Yeah, 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 for sure. I do feel, although after I get done with those, like they're super painful while they're happening, but afterwards I feel way better. I feel awesome. much more ready, like especially the next day when I'm getting ready for my run. It's, it's way better. Have you done those before? What's that? His like no oh no, you, not not from him specifically like there was one there was one day that you were offering i don't want to like, hear about massages. your happy Andy massages bro. <laughs> yeah well it was at his gym so right right that's yeah. true the, the, you had those college 
Oh yeah, yeah, people. yeah. But I never, I never <laughs> had a you specifically. <laughs> yeah, those coeds. Those, co- those coeds. Yeah, <laughs> that's really weird. Yeah, I never got a massage from Arlo. But then the day he's like, "Hey, we got a bunch of coeds down here." Just <laughs> sign, sign me up. up. <laughs> First in line. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. So thirteen years, really? Yes. Wow. Yep. I've not, uh, and you, um, but have you always been at that location? No, we were in South Ogden for. This is actually controversial because I thought we were in South Ogden for five years and then moved, and everybody else tells me, "No, you weren't there that long. You've been in this building longer." So um, I don't know. It's four a, or five years in South Ogden, and then we moved to Ogden. What, so. That's a controversy. That can for sure be measured. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's what they're telling me, but I'm on the, on the wrong end of the measurement. So oh, okay. I look, I look bad the when they it. start, <laughs> when they dig into it. I'm so. sure there's leases signed. And, <laughs> yeah. and what, no, and I never sign of, leases. Oh, yeah. That's pro- probably a good idea. <laughs> well, too, so you, uh, and you, wrote a, you wrote a couple books too, didn't you? Uh, yes, like one and nine-tenths of a book, actually. The other one's still a work in progress, but what, it'll be out soon. What's the name of the one that you published? So the first one is Warrior Core, uh, Core Strength. I can't even remember what it's called. Strength training, core training, something or other for the modern combat athlete. So for anybody who's reading this, like you just, if you just read that book by the end of that book, like not having done anything, just read it the whole way through. You will have a bang and six pack at the end of it, right? Probably. That's right. (laughs) Isn't that how it works? Uh, It's, uh, yeah. Do you have an audio book? Is it on audio? Audible, I mean. It is not. No. Dude, you should make no. one. It's a picture it book, though. It's a picture book, yeah. With, like, really good looking like models. Like pop ups? For sure. <laughs> yeah. Like really a po- good looking a, models. A pop up book? <laughs> yeah. It's a, like those old. It's, it's actually uh. a choose your own adventure pop up book. <laughs> yeah. 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 A choose your own adventure athletic pop up book. Yeah. That is a new. F- man, that is a niche type of. Right, right. Yeah. We definitely tried to. Are, are you a model in that, is why you said that? Well, I mean, maybe. That's not why I bring up that, but yeah. yeah. So the pop-up yeah, things yeah. like how they have those features where you like move an arrow up and down, you just pull it down, your freckles fall off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good line. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, yeah. Those are gross. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish there was such a button. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's unfortunately there. There occurs. Yeah. So. Well, like uh, Arlo is one of the most weirdly strong people I've ever met. And I, I actually during the, the photo shoot for warrior core is where I witnessed it. So, I mean, it, if you don't, if you know what a Turkish get up is, you're, you're already on pace with me here. If you don't know what a Turkish get up is, go to YouTube and look it up. So Arlo did a Turkish get up holding another person. He did it with a person, a 145 pound person, right? Wasn't that what miles Welk weighed or something like that? 140, 145. Yeah. He was in there somewhere. Yeah. That's, that's not something like Turkish get ups are something that most people do with 35 pounds and you're good. That's it. Arlo did it with a person. I don't know. It, it still, it still blows me away to watch that. And I, I, I I'd have a hard time believing it if I wasn't uh, spotting you, which you didn't need a spot every step of the way. It was <laughs> strange. Like, the the type of person that I would imagine could do a Turkish get up while holding a an hundred and forty five pound person would look Captain like, America. Like Captain America. <laughs> yeah. And Are you saying I don't? I'm saying Arlo like does Captain clearly America. not look like Captain America. <laughs> Captain America <laughs> yeah. Captain America looks like you. Yeah. Is That's what, right. Yeah. That's what it oh, is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I'd expect someone to weigh about one hundred more pounds than right, right. to be able to do that. That's what yeah. I'm getting at. But yeah. <laughs> weird, weird solid strength. But that's that. Uh, is that the cover? That's the cover picture, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That is a really cool picture. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't know he was doing a Turkish get up like that, I mean, there could be a whole lot of other things going on there. Again, it looks like you're about to throw that dude against a rock, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. He he about gagastined that guy. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It's that's right. right into his namesake yeah. for sure. <laughs> so, what, what's your new book? My new book is called Battle Tested. Uh, how to train like your life depends on it. And so it's geared towards, towards soldiers, definitely not just soldiers, but Marines and anybody in the military and law enforcement and also MMA fighters. The training style that we use for those type of people is very similar. We manipulate a couple of variables, but, but overall it's the same general mindset behind the training. Well, what is that? mindset what is that mindset yeah, without, sure, sure without little, giving dude. away all your proprietary material <laughs> yeah. which is jeff what jeff's trying to do right right, yeah. right. so the the basic mindset is that you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable and that's kind of cliche now people say that a lot but mm-hmm. but really that's what you need to get 
the point that you need to get to, people are very comfortable with their, I'm going to lift chest on Monday. I'm going to do whatever they do on Tuesday and mm-hmm. whatever they do on Thursday. And mm-hmm. I can't lift legs today because I did it yesterday and that kind of stuff. And that's, that's not realistic at all. Like if you're looking at a fighter, when his legs get tired, it doesn't matter. He has to continue mm-hmm. and he can't give up. He's, he's got to keep going. So, and same in the military, like you're not going to be in the middle of a firefight and be like, wait, 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 pause, hang on. I need to rest <laughs> two minutes before we start shooting at each other Dude, again. I did chess yesterday. I'm really, <laughs> right, I'm really right. sore. Like, exactly. You know. So we, we kind of take the general training philosophy that 90% of America follows and throw it out the window and kind of start over. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's good. So is it, I mean, is it, uh, are, are the exercises and lifts that are just like, I mean, you, you would never even think about them or are they pretty good traditional lifts just done in we do, different We do a combination schemes? of both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we, we'll always start each workout with a strength portion where we're doing more conventional lifts, mm-hmm. um, big lifts like squats, deadlift, bench press, that kind of stuff with mm-hmm. some, with some unique other ones as well. Mm-hmm. And then we'll get into more of a task specific section of the workout after the strength where we're doing stuff that kind of mimics the demands of whatever your profession is. Mm. And then we end with a finisher that is primarily to challenge your mind. So a fight to the death? Kind of, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We lost a lot of people in the in the writing of the book, but <laughs> it's hard to keep good now. It's hard right, to keep right. clients, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I I'm gonna actually pin you down for a freaking release date. A yeah. freaking release date. A freaking date. release date. Okay. Let's he do. already said November 11, 2016. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> right. That's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, so let's say, what is it now? February 12th? Mm-hmm. I would say by March 1st it will be done. All right. So, Justin, will this podcast be posted by March 1st? Do you want it to be? Yes, because that's going to make him get his book well, out. Yeah. Right, well, right. We, de- we definitely have to get it out before then. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Perfect. Why not? That's, that's, yeah. no, well, that's, now there's pressure. We need yeah. listeners to hold yeah. him accountable. Definitely. Yeah. All, all 12 of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's thousands. Yeah. They're yeah. depending on you, man. Yeah. All right. I'll all right. do 12 of I'll you. Do, I'll do it then. <laughs> yeah, good. That's Yeah, because don't you... Uh, don't you right now you you're responsible for you you train all of the Ogden City Police Department, don't you? Uh those of them that would like to train, I do, yeah. There's there's a lot of them that don't, but we yeah. do have a contract with Ogden City. And, so a handful well, of badasses cool. from Ogden City right, Police right. Department come to you. Definitely. Okay. Right. Yep. So those are much more efficient killers for the community. Oh, for sure. Sorry, yeah. protectors and servants. That's what I meant. Okay. There we go. <laughs> well, you just picked up another contract too. I did, yes. Yeah. So now, as soon as they get the uh, space ready, I'm also going to be teaching jujitsu to the police officers twice a week at the oh. at the police cat or oh, at wow. the police cool. department. So. so a lot of this stuff is very functional. I mean, yes. in, in terms yes. of what that is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a um there's a, a gal that I talked to, um at, is it Ellen Gallant? Yeah. Am I saying yeah, that yeah. correctly? Yeah. So she uh she climbed Everest and she, I think it was her third go that she made it right. right third right. times of the charm. Yes. And I, I remember I was on the phone with her because she had a TED Talk. She did TED Talks in Jackson. In Jackson Hole. Hole. yeah, yeah. Um and I watched the crazy story. Have you watched it? No. Yeah, so anybody listening, um if you I think if you just um Google Ellen Gallant G A L L a and T yes. Ted talk. You'll be able to see it. And she just shares her story of going up there because it was, uh, I mean, I don't want to steal her thunder, but a big piece of it was she went up there twice and, and Everest is so, I mean, you trained her to climb that mountain, right, correct? Right. right. Yes. Cause she, in your, in your, um, gym, you have her yes. signed one of your things that says, uh-huh. edge, uh, uh, she took a competitive edge flag to the top. Wow. Really? Well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That's that way cool. cool. <laughs> yeah. That's a, I mean, that seems so it's, I mean, cause it's not just, I mean, you like when she went up there, you can train and train and train, but honestly that mountain is just so damn unforgiving. Cause she went up there and there's just avalanches right, on, right. And, and people like legit yep. died and she's a, she's a yeah, medical doctor. Sure. And for so sure. she was trying to take care of that and, um, she had to help out. And I mean, two times surviving an avalanche, yeah. I mean, it just seems like, damn, I don't know if I just, I don't know if I'd go up there again. I mean, well, yeah, yeah. Man, the, well, oh, think about that, right? I mean, it's already what? 29,000 something feet. 29,035, yes. 29,035 feet, which is a bit of a climb. The, the hardest thing I have ever done was less than half that. And, and sort of like to think of doing double that, m- much colder, 
and then like throw in the possibility of avalanches. I don't, man. I don't. Well, think about so. If you, uh, so we're in Ogden, Utah, right now. So Ogden, and if you go, what is a uh, what's snow basin up here? Is what six thousand. Uh-huh. Six thousand feet. Crazy. So think of yeah, it's five times. Can I, can I see this mountain? I still think of it as that's a huge mountain, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, was it you? Oh was it gosh. you with five me? times that? Bro. That's or, insane. Or maybe it was you when we were down at. Um, we were running the Red Rock Relay down in um, southern Utah, and I think the Brian Head Ski Resort was ten thousand feet. And I remember running up that hill, and I was like, I could not catch my breath. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I'm, That's I'm, right. and right, right. I mean, when I get in running shape, I'm in shape. I can like run for a long time, and I was like, oh, I cannot catch my breath. I'm like, so wait a minute, That's almost triple what I was at. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Trip, like That's insane. Yeah, Brian Head's uh, ninety eight hundred, just under. Man, yeah. that is so. Oh my god. Well, hats off to her. That's a. That's for sure. I mean, if you're talking, Arlo, if you're talking about kind of the philosophy that you say is now a cliche about pushing yourself, uh, I mean, how do you put it? Pushing yourself beyond your level of comfort. Get, getting say? comfortable being uncomfortable. Being comfortable getting uncomfortable. Like that, uh, if that's not textbook definition, I don't know what is. Right, right. And I mean, so, so that concept, and that you're right, it's, it is definitely a cliche now. Uh, it's but it's something that we push on our clients a bit too. Nice. You know, it's, uh, the, the guys that we work with are, well, I mean, and again, you could make the argument that it's by their own doing, but their backs against the wall and they have a lot to deal with in terms of, uh, you know, managing probation stipulations, you know, to, trying to organize their already chaotic life and, uh, you know, get, get things, get things in order and, and make sense of making something of themselves. And we'll often have them explore areas of their mindset that probably aren't real fun to consider or fun to think about. And like there's, there's that component of it. And then also we, in previous podcasts, we've been talking about the opiate epidemic and a lot of the drug problems and kind of the idea of maybe being okay with tolerating pain a little bit. And that, I mean, obviously we not having pain that isn't self-induced is, is kind of the idea. It's good. But like, I guess, I guess being okay with having an achy knee or something. Right, and, right. And I know from training with you for, I don't know how many years I've been probably eight years now, maybe that probably. I've been training with you pretty exclusively. Like you, I, I've never seen a bigger, like you smile a lot cause you're a super nice guy, <laughs> but I've never seen you smile bigger than when I'm in excruciating pain. Right, like you, right. It's weird. Dude. It does like me you, good. You, <laughs> yeah. you do. So like, well, why, why is that so important to you? Like what, like, what is it about? I mean, maybe you're just a dick, but I doubt it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, well, what is it about seeing other people suffer and push themselves through that? you just seem to get such a sadistic glee out of. I think it's, it's primarily just watching people learn more about themselves. Okay. And a great answer. Okay, good. I'll stop there. No, no, no. Keep going. <laughs> keep, keep, keep going. Watching people learn more, learn more about. Yeah. Themselves. Yeah. Because everybody has this preconceived notion of this is what I'm capable of. This is what I can tolerate. And when you take them past that and they see that I'm actually capable of more and that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I think I'm better for having done it. That's, that's really rewarding to me and, and for them. Mm -hmm. I think it, I mean, is your, so one of the things I I wanted to make sure, um, part of the reason we asked you on was, I mean, in terms of, uh, physical being, I mean, like you're typically my go-to guy. I mean, if I'm hurt or if I'm, if I have questions about something, I usually say, Hey Arlo, you know, what's up with this? And if you need to go get ready for a marathon, I can do you for a massage, you know, I'll right. be, um, and, uh, and plus, you know, and I, and I don't trust anybody as much as I trust you with a lot of that information, you know, and that's just built up over time that we've been able to kind of interact in some of those things. And I think about that because, uh, that it's so important to be able to kind of push yourself beyond your own personal limits and find what your potential is, which in a lot of ways, I don't think many of us know that, you know what I mean? Right, I think right. that we don't know our own personal threshold, our well, own limit. Well, and, and no, I don't think we do. And what's fascinating about that is I think once we get there, it almost extends itself at that point too. <laughs> yeah, sure, you know, we sure. were able to go even further on some of those things. And, and to me, if you're, 
a lot of, I think, what of our clients go through in terms of their mental well-being is, is a lot of doubt and mm. a lot of, you know, they doubt themselves. I think they don't have a whole lot of self-esteem. I think they, um, they, they think they have an inability to cope. And when you get to that point, pushing yourself physically, and, and it, you know, it takes a lot of mental fortitude to get through this stuff too. Right, right. Well, at that point too, you're showing, you're giving yourself the evidence that you can push forward. I mean, mm. that's, yeah, that's yeah. basically um, your evidence to show that you have the ability to deal with ups and downs of life, you know, which we all do to some right, degree. Right, for sure. And being able to cope with challenges and making the most of opportunities and stuff like that. I think that that's really important. I mean, there's a really big connection there physically and mentally when I'm able to do those things. That's why I loved your answer so much, Arlo. You know, it, it, the, the parallel is definitely there with our clients. And like, I, I can't help myself when I'm talking with my clients. I, I share a lot about my own personal hobbies, like with the, the like with lifting weights and with jujitsu and things like that. And I mean, I, I probably shared a variation of a story just to kind of show my own growth. Like there, there I mean, there's been times where you and I are 45 minutes deep into a grappling session. Your your energy is well above my, mine. You're like kneeling on my face or something, which I, <laughs> I just love that you've been picking up that habit, by the way. Good, good. Yeah. And, and I like, aim to please. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I want to quit. I've, I've, there, there's been times where I've wanted to quit and I'll never let you know that you, you don't, I don't, you, don't. you hide it very well. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the thoughts there and like whether or not I end up coming out on top in the match or you end up catching me or whatever it is like, I, I'll always kind of put a check mark in my head that I didn't quit nice. even if I wanted to. And that, that transcends to other stuff too. You know, there's like, you know, the, the three of us, Grilla social work podcasters, you know, we're, or this is definitely not our full time job. We have a pretty demanding job that takes a lot of our time and effort and be pretty easy to you know, call it a day early or whatever it is. Uh, but, you know, pushing through helps there as well, you know, constantly developing ourselves. And our, again, I, I think, I think clients look up. I'm not saying they look up to me like I'm some kind of cool guy, but I mean, they, they look for examples. Maybe it's what I'm getting at. They look for examples of other people that have, faced some type of adversity and then pushed through. And one thing that we can all relate to, and again, this is where you come in, is when it comes to physical exertion, that that's a very it's a measurable, easily understood concept that that helps it helps make a bigger point that you could relate to like a metaphor about life. But there's something about grinding through a grueling workout that probably everybody can relate to. Right, right. I have a quick story about Jeff if if nobody minds. <laughs> oh, yeah, I definitely is it, don't mind. Yeah, <laughs> is, is it, it embarrassing? Yeah, I hope so. It might yeah. be a little bit for him, but it's it's Good. not too bad. Is it going to result so, him losing his job? I don't think so. No, well, we'll see. We'll I'll see. Add, I'll add that twist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, wait. <laughs> and, and he doesn't have any idea what I'm about to say, and that makes it all the better. But oh, all there right. was one time that we were working out, and we were out in the parking lot. Um, we used to do what we called pain in the parking lot, where mm-hmm. we tried to beat his, beat ourselves up really bad and and just do really hard things. And we were pushing a truck and dragging a tractor tire at the same time. Uh, I don't know if maybe he's starting to remember this at all or not, but Mm, he made it maybe half the length of the parking lot. And he said, I can't do it anymore. And he stopped. And I'm like, that's crazy. I've never seen Jeff stop anything. And no joke, within an hour of when he left, I got a text that said, you'll never see me quit again. Hmm. And that was awesome. (laughs) And I'm like, that's so cool. Cause sometimes it takes us getting to that breaking point where we actually do give up to, to kind of set our sights on that sucked. And that's not where I want to be. And it's never going to happen again. And we're going to change right now, right here. And you're never, you're never going to see me quit again. And I have a while ago. Yeah. That was years ago. That was really disappointing for the, I remember sending you that. I was like, that is not, what I do. <laughs> no, yeah, and I had never seen it before and I have never seen it again. And mm. yep, he committed to himself and to me that, yeah, I'm never going to quit again. And, and he hasn't. Well, so, I bet, I good bet job. Along Thanks, the, the lines of what you're talking about, there's a lot of spillover, you know? So say, for example, if I'm someone that I go to the gym often, but yeah, I kind of half ass my workouts and I give up and I don't really push myself. I'm willing to bet for the most part that spills over into other aspects of that person's life. Like at mm. work, they probably tend to not fully push themselves and get kind of yeah. used to giving up where, you know, I, I think a big part of when I, when I got into working out was just 
realizing, yeah, where do I tend to give up and where do I tend to do that? Oh, this feels uncomfortable. It's kind of burning too much. Hey, I kind of want to quit here. And we're learning to work past that and push myself on that. And then realizing, I think, well, I can, where else can I do that? And my life work. Where else can I push myself, whether it's like school or work? But I think tying that in from the obvious health benefits of working out. But I think aside from that, learning to push yourself in that sense, I think helps you to learn to push yourself in a lot of other ways too. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And, and makes it more doable because obviously you're in better shape. It, well, part, bra- of that, part of that too, I, I mean, look at that though. It, you're just talking about basic, basic things that a person wants, having control and freedom of your own life, mm-hmm. I mean, in other words. I mean, having a sense of purpose, feeling valued. And that whole idea of mental well-being the, and you know, physical well-being being a piece of this, look, I'm, I'm not saying that means you're going to be happy all the time. I don't think that's what any of us are looking at, right? It doesn't mean that you won't experience negative or painful emotions, grief, loss, any of those, you know, failure, obviously. That's, that's a part of normal life. However, I think... Whatever your age, whatever, you know, um, you know, your gender, whatever, whatever is going on in your life, I think f- being physically active ha- can help you lead a healthier life, mentally healthier life, and it can pr- improve your overall well-being. There's just no question about that. There's definite bleed over into other areas of our life, like Justin, like you were saying, you know, and, so, and, and, and it does have that effect, right? So like, like Mace is saying, if you have it in you to push through a workout, you also probably have it in you to, you know, make one extra widget, whatever your job is, you know, whatever it is. And conversely, if you give yourself permission to give up here, that's a, that's a habit that cascades pretty quick. Well, yeah. Say for example, I'm in the habit of pushing through really difficult physical workouts. And then, you know, a week later I lose my job, whatever. I'm probably much more willing to push myself through something difficult emotionally or mentally, you know, like a breakup or something like that. No, I know I can push through this. I know I can get through this. I think it just sets up the mentality of being like stress resilience, really, that I can push through difficult situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, Exactly. Uh, Arlo, uh, I'm going to explain this weird sounding euphemism. Explain embrace the suck. (laughs) So embrace the suck is, it's basically just that, when you find yourself in a situation that sucks, there's really nothing you can do about it, but buckle down and get through it. Like mm-hmm. nothing I can do can change the situation except for my attitude and, and what, oh. how I view the situation. Like I can't even think of a good example right now, but, but, but well, in the uh, middle uh, of a difficult situation, out. yeah. well, you can always quit working out. You shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess even going back to Ellen. So Ellen, um, she went over to Everest twice. It's very financially taxing. Obviously, it's very expensive to climb Everest. How much? I thought I looked into that, and I thought the cheapest route, which you may not want to go with. I mean, you're going to Everest after right, all. Right. I thought it was like some astronomical, like sixty five thousand dollars. Yeah. So sixty to sixty five thousand is, <laughs> oh is the my cheapest. God. Oh wow. Um, it's like fifteen thousand. I want to say just for the climbing permit, and then most people go with a guide service, which costs yeah. a lot, and they need to pay for oxygen. They pay for because you're travel probably gonna. I mean, there's so. a high percentage you're gonna croak. I mean, they gotta <laughs> retrieve you with a helicopter. I don't know that it's a high percentage. I'm trying to remember <sighs> what it is, but there's there's Isn't enough there people, people like that still have died. up there. They're oh, just yeah. chilling. Yeah, yeah. Literally. Sure. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> Frozen. No offense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but that has been a goal of hers for 15 years. That's been her primary focus. She's she's dedicated her life to that. That's she awesome. quit her job as a partner in a cardiology clinic to pursue this. When oh, her, she talks about that on the podcast. Yeah, her, her, or part, not her, her partners talk. said said, no, you can't go. We don't want you to go. And she resigned the next day. You know, wow. she thought, well, she thought about it over wow. the weekend and she walked in and said, okay, I'm done. That mm-hmm. is um, courageous right. to pursue a dream. Yeah. You yeah, yeah. Quit a job like that. For sure. And then she gets there in the first year, there's an avalanche that kills 16 Sherpas in the ice fall. And, and so she just, she ends up being the one when they haul the dead people out from a helicopter hanging from, from a line on the, on the end of a helicopter, they land the people she helps to identify them. She's taking pictures of them and trying wow. to figure out who she, who they are. Um, and so that's her first experience with Everest after she quit she, her medical practice, after she quit her medical practice, Man. Yep. she goes back the next year, which would be hard enough for like a lot of people after going through that would be like, okay, that's it. You know, I'm not yeah. going to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. The next year, 22 people die in an avalanche that goes right through base camp. Um, 
And she literally thought she was going to die. She saw it coming, heard it coming. And she had a little bit of video on that, didn't she? Uh, somebody oh, else had wow. video. I didn't we, know that. Yeah, piece. we saw a video. Dude, it was gnarly. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yep. So she hears it coming, sees it coming, and dives into her tent and actually knocks out a tooth. Um, oh. <laughs> thinking, this is it. I'm going to die, and I hope it is quick and painless, you know. But mm-hmm. um, So 20 people. 22 people die. She ends up being in charge of head wounds, her and another doctor, and they work through the night trying to save these people that are, that are gravely injured. Um, and she came back from that time thinking, I can't do it again. And, mm-hmm. and it didn't take long. And she's like, I'm going. Wow. <laughs> and, and so there's the kind of thing where you can be like, I mean, obviously, when, when your life is kind of on the line and you're thinking, I, I escaped twice when I, when I could have very well been in an avalanche, you know, that, that brings a whole new aspect into it. But, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad I had you explain that. I was going to share an example about how like my lungs kind of burn when I run hard. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yes. yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's so yeah. much. Wow. So that's anyway, intense. she, she came back after the sec- second year saying, I, I can't go back. And she changed her mind. She took a year off and she went back and she achieved her goal. Um, and that's kind of like, the the whole embrace this suck yeah this this has been terrible and and there's not much I can do about it I just need to push on because this is my goal and I need to achieve it mm-hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of situations where that can that can come into play but another thing that she has said that that is just fascinating to me um, that I really respect is is she said you know looking back I wouldn't change a thing because things happened on on her four or on her third trip. <laughs> This past year, May of 2017, they were at Camp 4, and she played an integral part of saving two other climbers that, were, um, that would have likely died had they not hel- had help. And she met a, a, young, a young Sherpa. He's 20 years old. And she ended up giving him care there, and now he's, he lost his hands because of frostbite. Oh, um, and she, was, she actually went back to Nepal to pick him up and bring him to the United States for medical treatment. And she's all, you know, looking back, if I had summited the first year or the second year, I wouldn't have been there for him. I never would have met him. Who knows what would have happened. And what a crazy way of looking at that. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So sometimes like during the moment we miss out on the big picture because we don't know what's going to come, but looking back, mm-hmm. we can see all the things that fell into place because of what we went through. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And the same can be from working out. Like we can push through, a really hard workout when all we want to do is quit and we can look back on it and go, wow, I really learned a lot. And I, and I'm glad that I went through that. And a lot of people, I think uh, like, uh, I don't know, naysayers to that would just, I, I think their argument against that would be something like, well, that's just confirmation bias. I mean, she just had to found, you know, so Ellen's experience with that or, or you, you know, having a meaningful experience with your buddy while you're out doing a Ragnar or something like that, or, I mean, whatever it is, you know what, or jujitsu or, or any of these things, that's just your confirmation bias. You were looking for something to make this meaningful, which I'm like, okay, that, so you're full of shit is what I would say to that person. I said, (laughs) look, her ability to put herself in those extraordinary circumstances leads to extraordinary activities. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. She's an extraordinary person. I mean, she's a medical doctor, for God's sakes. I mean, going on, you know, leaving a medical practice to go on to some of these. And I think even on, on her podcast, she talked a little bit about how that, you know, really affected her life in, in negative, yeah. but also very positive ways, too. And I think if, if you're engaging a lot of this physical activity, it transcends the physical activity, like Justin's talking about. It's more than just, I'm a meathead going in there for these things. You know, right. we set, I know every year, um, one of the things that Jeff and I do is when we go, we set ourselves, um, you know, new year's resolutions, right. And we try to say, this is what we're going to do this year for whatever we're doing. And, uh, and man, it just seems like those things are just so important and they have a lot of, a lot more meaning than the, the amount of weight that you pushed or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and it is way more meaningful. There's a lot more meaning be, than beyond just that. And her experience is, is really, right. well, not even that, but the part of what you were talking about is, is if someone were to say that confirmation bias, in some ways I might even be like, yeah, actually, if I go do Ragnar in a van for two days running and you can't sleep, it actually sucks a lot. So I am looking for what do I actually like about that experience? I'm actually taking out of that the fact I get to do that with my friends that I got to push myself because you could easily do that and people do. This sucked. This was awful. I'll never do that again. 
and I had the same experience, but I saw it much differently. It was like, <laughs> ah, that was awesome. Because you know, I remember after I, when I, when you guys invited me to do my first one, it was like, I do this every year, even when you're like, hey, let's do an ultra. My default is, yeah, sure. An hour later, I'm like, oh, God. Like, why, <laughs> did I, why did I do that? But every time, it's awesome. But you have, well, to, you have to choose to make it awesome. So both statements can be true about Ellen. So Mace's point is that she's an extraordinary person that put herself into an extraordinary situation. And so naturally somebody that has that level of ability, talent and mindset is, is going to naturally be in those situations to make it happen just by nature of who she is. And you know that those people aren't common. They don't exist very often. And so it, maybe it shouldn't come as a surprise that she, did this amazing thing for this Nepalese, was he a Sherpa? You said, yes. Yeah. You know, and, and, and helped him out. Like that's, that's, that is an extraordinary woman in an extraordinary circumstance. Of course she did it. And then to, to your point, Justin, if you're, if we're talking about confirmation bias, like, yeah, maybe, maybe it is. Uh, but like that, that's a whole lot of how we teach people to rethink anyway, right? We're, yeah. When we're talking about modifying our thinking, modifying our perceptions, I mean, uh, I, I guess we're kind of encouraging that. I guess if you're aware that you're doing it and you're aware that, okay, I'm trying to find meaning after the fact. Now, if I'm in like a philosophical debate with somebody, they're going to say I'm using confirmation bias. <laughs> but if I'm talking about for my own mood management purposes and trying to derive meaning and purpose to make me more likely to do this badass thing again, then yeah. Okay. Sure. Confirmation mm-hmm. bias, but look how cool I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah, is there any, is there any no. part of my job that where I enjoy doing paperwork? Like absolutely not. So probably like you're saying, like embrace the suck or enjoy, yeah. <laughs> which is a big part of it. Like there'd be things I'm just like, eh, it's, it's just part of it. You just have to get it done. But if you sit there and you dwell on how bad it sucks every second or every right, keystroke, right. it's like, well, then you're making it a million times worse mm-hmm. as opposed to, well, I, also, I like getting a paycheck. You know, I like meeting with clients. So there's good things that come out of it. It's just some of the things that come with it. Eh, I don't like it. This part just sucks. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, there's, it, it's like that. Um, I think it was, um, uh, what is it? The, seven habits of highly effective. There was a really, I mean, th- I'm not trying to get all, you know, it's in, a chicken soup. For, yeah. Chicken soup for the seven chicken habits. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> chicken, chicken soup for the seven habits of highly seven effective, effective leaders, with highly effective, <laughs> highly, highly effective stuff for highly dummies. effective. Good to great yeah. liver dies. <laughs> anyway, good book. One of the, one of the things that I remember from that is, um, you know, I think people, especially in their, their jobs, like there's a great example. Um, I would, you know, all of us have worked in jobs where we know people who just are totally miserable at, you know, in their jobs. And, and that's one of the, most of the time that they're out of the house, it's pr- predominantly what they do during the day and the other parts of this. And, and, um, and a lot of times people say, you know, he asked a really good question there. And he said, um, do you feel like your value as a person is worth more than the numbers that you see on the paycheck? Mm-hmm. And I think everybody can look at that and say, yeah, probably. Okay, fine. That's great. I mean, but okay. So then how do I get past that potential? And we're, I mean, the stuff we're talking about, I think to a lot of people listening to this, they might be kind of intimidated about some of these things. I mean, climbing Mount Everest for, you know, like, or I'm even intimidated running, by that. Totally. <laughs> I, totally. Or even running Ragnar or doing, or, you know, all the, you know, training all these things. Um, but I mean, the thing is, is like, I think even, um, I was paying attention to, it was, um, some research I was paying, I was looking up, but this was for the mental health foundation in the United kingdom. And one of the things they were saying was, um, even short bursts of like 10 minutes of brisk walking can increase mental alertness, energy, and positive mood. I mean, 10 minutes 10, of walking, 10 minutes of brisk walking. Think about that. Anybody can do that. Anybody can accomplish that. But I would say if, if you're, if you can't bear to be present in your own life, I mean, there's a problem there and there's a, I mean, you have to push past that. You, this whole embrace the suck thing. Yeah, man, I get it. I'm not, this is where people kind of get into this idea that, well, I'm overweight already. Working out is really hard. Um, you wouldn't understand because, and maybe I don't understand. Mm -hmm. I, maybe I have a whole lot of hard, I have a hard time empathizing because I'm not you and I don't know what it's like to be just doing this from the ground up or, you know, any of those things. I think that's totally true. And I feel for that, but 
yeah, I've got to do something. I mean, you know, doing nothing and, and just continuing to degrade in my own life and just becoming miserable. I mean, some of the most people, the most miserable people I have are, that I've ever met are also the most physically out of shape people and people who just are, you know, unhappy with themselves altogether. And it's, and it's sad. I think it's really sad. And part of this physical fitness is obviously going to improve yourself as well. You're going to, you're going to have a whole new outlook on life. So yeah, if <clears throat> I'm actually glad you addressed that. So point, point it, your microphone up a little bit. If we're talking, you know, 10 minutes oh, yeah. of way brisk walk. Yeah. What's the stat again? 10 minutes of brisk walking does what? Something cool for my mind. So they just, I mean, this is, they just said even a short burst of 10 minutes of brisk walking increases our mental alertness, energy, and positive mood. That's, I mean, I'm really trying to stay away from cheesy cliches about journey of a thousand miles. Something. Don't say that word yeah, journey. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's bad enough to lead off with that. But I mean, I mean the concepts there, right? If I think when people are trying to start up any kind of lifestyle change, maybe, maybe even more specifically like exercise and working out and they had this idea that they need to do, whatever the Dallas Cowboys are during doing in their current training camp mm. and that they need to work out for this many hours a day, this many days a week. And I mean, uh, uh, again, like it, if you've been, if you are involved in physical activity, you, you know that that's not the case. You know that you have to start somewhere. Uh, but, but I think a lot of people, well, I, I think a lot, I mean, you, you probably hear a lot of these reasons in trying to talk people to, to sign up for your services, Arlo. But I mean, you, there is, there is, maybe unrealistic expectations of what beginning a workout pro program is. And then I'm sure fear of judgment play comes into play. You know, I, I've talked to a lot of people that are worried what other people think about them while they're working out at a gym. Like, so, like I guess may, Arlo, if you maybe want to address some of the, some of the barriers that are either self-imposed or externally imposed that you see new clients or new people coming in and like what you sort of say to them to help them work around it, that'd be helpful. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So definitely like you were saying, a lot of people feel uncomfortable and they don't want to be seen in a gym because they're so out of shape. And I think, I think a lot of them have the perception that, that we will, more fit people will look at them and, and make fun of them and say, Oh, look at that person and how they are. And, and look how out of shape they are, whatever. But I think the opposite is actually true. The majority of the time where, where people who are fit realize this person's really out of shape and they're here in the gym and they are, they're taking steps to change that. And that's awesome. Um, I think you'll get that the majority of the time, obviously there's going to be some people that, that will be jerks and, and be rude and be like make fun of them or whatever. But I think, I think by and large, the majority of the population that you'd find in a gym would be proud of them and happy that they're trying to change. Yeah, um, I would agree. It's probably, it's probably the reality of most people there, probably not in a mean way, but won't even notice you, won't even cross right, their mind. Right. The people yeah. that do, probably a very small percentage of those people that will actually think something malicious, and even if they do, screw those people. Well, yeah. well I mean, there's assholes everywhere, right? Yeah. But I, I think about, like, if I went into Gold's Gym and... So let's just say this is a person who's in shape. Um, okay, you just, I think equally for that person of how unhappy and how they, and how much they can't bear to be present in their own lives is equally true because think about what's going on there. I mean, so when I go there, I'm very much like the first person. I don't notice anybody in the gym cause right. I don't care. I mean, I'm just there to get my thing done and get out of there and not talk. And I don't have time for a conversation. It's not that I'm mean. I just don't want to hear hot. Yeah. It's <laughs> hotty wear. Yeah. So I, I just don't want to have a conversation with anybody. Right, just I just want to be left alone, which is not asking much. I'm just you know I'm neutral on the on the subject. But there are people there that I think their their lives and who they are is very much defined by you know the right, gym, right. and they're in there for, for hours sure. at a yeah. time. And kind of like referring back to, I'm doing chest on Monday and this on that day, and I'm never really growing or whatever, you know. And and everything revolves around, um, you know. Okay, you know, they're probably doing steroids on top of all this other stuff, and get, you know. And I'm not making a lot of assumptions here. I'm just saying people like that. Um, I don't think they're very, you know, pleased with themselves either. E oh, either, yeah, which is sure. just makes it a lot easier to kind of just talk shit on a person who's walking in there trying to get themselves. I mean, oh, yeah. some of the, you think about people who get the most cheers when we're at Ragnar are people who are, 
you know, extremely overweight, right, but right, running sure. down that path. And like, which is what I love about that race is, you know, all shapes and sizes can do that. And those people are the ones who get the most cheers. And I don't think people are, are being, you know, malicious towards those people. I think they're genuinely saying, Hey, good for you. But then you got to ask, okay, well, what kind of a person is going to be out there doing their runs anyway? You mm-hmm. know, and there's only a select few that are going to do that. And you know, the douchebags in the gym are just going to be in there pumping iron, you know, <laughs> taking selfies. You like, know, I, I still no offense, think there's nothing wrong with selfies. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. uh, well, I still think that the douchebags in the gym are still the minority. Yeah, this, I think the, so. this Absolutely. Is just I'm just saying yeah. there's assholes everywhere. There are. I, I would say that I, I, I kind of want wonder this about people that maybe aren't in the best shape that are worried about this very thing we're talking about. Like I would say that most adults that put in the time and energy to get in really good shape are probably pretty actualized people that aren't of the bully mindset. I I think what happens probably is uh, maybe, maybe people that aren't in great shape. Remember the dickheads from high school that were in good shape because they, you know, play on the team or whatever Uh, like that. I swear when people grow up, most adults, most (laughs) people that are past whatever stage that is um, and the the type of person that goes to the gym and keeps in good shape, they they probably also are successful elsewhere and don't feel compelled to bully the new person. Right. Right. Well, yeah. And I think also on the flip side of that, I think it's something we all deal with on some level, kind of like we have, we all have our own insecurities. I mean, I think most people that know me think, you know, I'm pretty easygoing, pretty confident guy, and I am. There's times still all the time in the gym I'll think, you know, I've got little love handles going on. I got it. And I'll think about, like, does someone notice that in a shirt, you know? And I just kind of let it go. I'm like, who cares? You know, I'm here to work on me. It doesn't matter. But So I think everybody in some way can think that in some way. Yeah. So it's not like just yeah, because you true. haven't been in the gym, well, now you're just really down on yourself and you're you're the only one in this building dealing with self-esteem issues. Like, I think about it. It crosses my mind when I'm in there. Sometimes I'll look in the mirror and think, like, oh, well, I don't really like that angle or whatever. I need to work on that. But other people obviously see that. But I think that's also kind of like normalizing that in a sense that we all kind of feel that way in some way or another. That's right. not necessarily unique to a certain person. Mm-mm. So our, our little like – I, I guess if, unless you have more to say about how to address the people that maybe are worried about judgment, you, I mean, feel free to do that. But uh, also, kind of coming back to the 10 minutes of brisk walking concept Mace talked about, like, you, well, one of the things I've noticed about you is, so you, you write these books for the elite of the elite, you know, battle tested, you're, you're writing for like, you know, military people and cage fighters. But I've seen you... Like I, I see your clientele, you know, and you, you've got you've got beasts, and then you have people that are you, you. You work with some of the elderly people. You work with pregnant girls. You work with uh, people that are. If you were going to look at a continuum of physical fitness, I've seen everybody walk through your door. Right, right. And so, obviously, you're not having everybody push trucks and pull tractor tires while swinging chains and whatever the crazy <laughs> sadistic crap you do. Like, so, uh, what are some real simple stuff that would meet your satisfaction that, that maybe like people could get up and do right now, right now? Yeah. Is this the 22nd thing or, or that, anything? Well, uh, actually that's another question. That's another question as well. That's, that's, but yeah, just, like if someone decided like, yeah, you know what? I'm liking what these guys are saying. This Arlo sounds like a nice person, you know, uh, sounds like he's trapped between a rock and a hard spot though with these guys. Um, uh, and he really wants to throw them against a rock wall. He really wants to throw Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> if, if someone like that's listening and they're like, you know what? Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm doing it. I'm going to go do something. What would that thing be? So first off, we have them come in and we kind of evaluate where they're at. We, we have a, a, a movement screen that we take them through and see what they're capable of. Hmm. Um, and then from there, it's, it's kind of educated guesswork. I want to say it's just guesswork. Like, I think they're capable of this. And the first couple of sessions, we're finding out what they are actually capable of. Um, but definitely, we start them out slow and, and just push them a little more and a little more until we kind of find that spot where they're challenged, but they're but it's not going to overdo it. They're, they're not going to leave and never want to come back. That's like so, a risk assessment. That, that's super, <laughs> is it a, well, no, that what you're talking about though, is super critical. I think, right, right. Um, patience. So uh, I, 
a lot of guys that I've, that I've talked to. So, I mean, I kind of, um, uh, when I, when I'm working out, I, I go through seasons and, um, people are always commenting on specifically like my weight and then also how I'm putting weight on and taking weight off and everything like that. But a lot of that though is because I've just done it so many times. I think my mm-hmm. body's so used to doing this over periods of time that I don't, I don't, it's not like I'm going through crazy diets or anything like that or, I mean, I'm running a whole lot more and obviously that changes right. things, but I'm just, uh, what I, what I think is it's that stuff did not happen overnight. I mean, what you're doing with jujitsu did not happen over. I mean, how many Guinness book of world records do you have Arlo? I don't think we brought that up yet. No official ones yet, but soon to be four. soon to be four. What are they? So they're all squat thrusts with a weighted backpack okay. as many as you can in a minute. And what's a squat thrust? So it's like a burpee, but it's without the push up and without the jump at the top. So you're just from your feet down into a push up position and back up. Okay. Wow. How many did you do? How many? Eight? So I did, God, I'll try and remember. So I, I did it with a hundred pound pack and I got 14 or 15 repetitions. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. In a minute? In, a, in one minute. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yep. Yeah. And then I did it with an 80 pound pack and a 60 pound pack and a 40 pound pack. How many reps did you get with a 40 pound pack? 25. Wow. Well, you're also a big guy. Like, how tall are you? What do you weigh? Uh, so I am about 200 pounds and six foot three. Oh, wow. wow. Well, and so, I, so again, I think somebody listening to that, they'd be like super intimidated. This is a Guinness Book of World Record holder always wrote two books. Okay, look, if you overdo it, which a lot of people do, and they come in there, and I think sometimes they just work with a trainer. And, and the cool, <laughs> to me, you would be the trainer I'd go to because you've been there and done that. There's something to be said about this. I mean, right, right. If, if I go to a trainer who, um, you know, unfortunately doesn't fit the part, right? You kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, I, and they say, oh, here's your training regimen. I look at that and I'm like, oh, this is Jamie Eason's regimen that I got off of bodybuilding.com. Like, oh, so you just copied that and gave it to me. There's no act, you know, like actual analysis or, and I like that you're saying guesswork because ultimately we don't know. I want to push you to the threshold of what you're capable of then, but not to the point where you're so beaten down you can't recover and come over that. Right, so right. people don't have patience for that. Um, they, I think patience is critical when you're trying to develop physical physical health because everybody wants to jump in and I'm going to kill it. People get super motivated, and we all like to think of, of ourselves as badasses in the future. Yeah, yeah. But the right here and right now is what's important. And if I overdo it and injure myself or if I'm just too damn, you know, beat up to go the next day, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to go. Yeah, it's yeah, too much. And sure. so I, I like that, that idea. I'm not going to push you beyond that threshold. That's a really good uh, starting point is don't push too hard. Be patient with yourself. This is a process. This isn't an event. You know, it's going to take some time mm. to kind of get there. That's really good. So once you've established that, then what do you do? So then we just, uh, <clears throat> Let's see. After we establish where they're at, then then we want to definitely progress from there. So every week that they come, we're working them a little harder, pushing them a little more. They're lifting more weight or they're doing more repetitions or less rest. There's a lot of ways to, to incrementally increase their workload. Um, and definitely we, ch- we try and keep it creative and fun. I think that helps a lot as far mm-hmm. as keeping people coming to the gym and keeping them motivated, just, just mixing it up and doing things that they <laughs> maybe have never done before. Uh, uh, so on that point, this is a quick <laughs> offshoot. Uh, tell our listeners some of your gym equipment. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> we have several we, boulders. <laughs> we have a broken yeah. treadmill that we use daily. Yeah. Uh, what do you use that for? Just to beat it up? No, no, we rerun on it. Oh, okay. The motor does not work, but it makes it way more effective. Oh, really, yeah. really hard. So you're yeah. f- forcing it to work in a... <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay, nice. You are the motor. Yeah. Yep, so we use that daily. Uh, God, let's see. We, we have stability balls full of water that move all over the place when you try and pick them up. Mm. And they come in assorted weights and sizes. Mm-hmm. But, uh, slosh pipe. A slosh pipe. Explain yes. a slosh pipe. So a slosh pipe is a 10-foot length of 4-inch PVC pipe that's two-thirds full of water. And you pick it up, and all the water runs to one end, and you try and balance it, and it all runs to the other end. And, and it's just a, it's a struggle to even get it off the ground. That was the one I tried way back when, when, when oh, Jeff was yeah. yeah, that was nice. awesome. At the lair? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, running across the parking lot with it. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it constantly balances back right, and forth. Right. Yeah. That is yeah, so we do a lot of different things uh, with that. But, tra- tractor but yeah, tires? walking with it. Oh, tractor mm-hmm. tires, definitely. Sledgehammers? We, we, yep. Yep. And <laughs> thanks to Jeff, we, has, we have a battle axe. Battle axe? And yeah. a 67 pound sledgehammer, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we don't start the new people with that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I like though that you're. I mean, it 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 does. If I if I was coming to something like competitive edge, I'm certainly obviously thinking outside the way outside of the box um, <laughs> compa- on on what my exercises would be because traditionally, right. I, again, if I if I go to like Gold Gym or something like that, it's just meatheads everywhere, kind of doing you know this just routine exercises and everything. It's nice to kind of step outside of that, you know, right, right, and getting into those. I mean, I, I think it can be a bit scary for anybody that's going to be making these changes. That's pretty normal. Um, I and aside from like cost or injury, illness, lack of energy, those type of things, you know, we kind of I think body image is a huge barrier. You know, yeah, um, yeah. it makes me um, think that. I thought it was going to be a total flop, and I don't know if it's been successful or not. But have you seen that Cubex gym? I don't get it. Well, it seems so. It seems to me. I think people are really anxious about how their body will like. It was like what Justin was, Justin was just referring about. I think people get really anxious about what their body's going to look like while others are around, and uh-huh. and so they're going to avoid exercise as a result. And so I think those Cubex things. Um, offer a reprieve from that i mean think so, about so it. that's why it's privacy i think it has to be oh it's got to be because i mean think about this i i've again I, I remember i worked at a gym called performax in um layton and they had a women's only section i was like mm. man what have we done to ourselves where you have to create a women's only section so dudes aren't gawking at them 24 7 i mean if, even if you're i mean, overweight or banging like that probably makes a lot of sense to step mm. in there so dudes aren't like totally you know just gawking over you the the entire time and the cubex thing seems really functional because i don't have to be embarrassed it's just me inside of a cube working out and it's very private and everything mm. like that i mean I, I can't imagine it's beyond just that that's got to be the reason why i don't know why that didn't occur to me but that that has to be i i haven't been able to figure out that gym like why why would i do that you know, but that makes yeah. sense. Well, you're comfortable, I think. I mean, so, I mean, what advice mm-hmm. would you have to a person who's going through that? I'm really uncomfortable with my body image. And, I mean, you can't go in there, you know, I don't know, dressed like in a way that kind of doesn't show that off. You kind of have to dress the part when you go to work out because it's functional, right? Right. I mean, right. What, what kind of advice would you give to somebody like I that? I think we're in a little bit of a unique situation at Competitive Edge that we are very small and there's never very many people in there at once. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's a more comfortable environment. We don't have very many mirrors. We have two mirrors and they're by the squat racks and mm-hmm. nobody really looks in them. Um, so I think that's, that kind of sets us apart there um, from that perspective. It's easier for somebody to come to competitive edge and work with me because there's not going to be as many people around and the people that are around are going to be very supportive. Um, in other gyms, I think we just have to go back to that. Um, you just have to take action. You have to know that you might be uncomfortable, but to make change, you have to go through it and you have mm-hmm. to you have to step in there and get started and start mm-hmm. somewhere and well, I think and hope that some people will or that most people will appreciate that and it seems like even just encouraging. making it a part of your daily life i mean right, anything right. i mean i um i regularly park super far away from the doors one because i don't have to deal with other idiots around my parking and i can just pull right out but the other is too i gotta walk i gotta walk to get in there i refuse absolutely refuse to take elevators too which nice. drives my clients crazy and i should be a little bit more considerate sometimes but think about those <laughs> just those two things you could do to improve like that's making it part of your life and i and i do that specifically that was referring on a on a podcast a couple times ago i remember how i was saying i don't like waiting in lines for food like yeah. it, <laughs> it's just i don't know what my pet peeve is with that but i those are i think um just trying to do tasks more energetically i mean i i right, i got a sure. standing desk at my office which i know is like total like you know smug type of thing but i i i found yeah, myself a big well a big <laughs> <laughs> a big piece of this though was um and i got a standing desk for my house too a big piece of this though was when i was sitting down you probably have a standing bed too <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have a bed <laughs> yeah well but i but that's the thing i like to get as much as i can out of a day as possible right i mean yeah i probably get don't get enough sleep okay whatever but i mean like 
if I I want to be as energetic as possible, and I can't do that, and I found that yeah, I I do not get tired when I'm up, and I'm you know I got because my job when I'm doing clinical quality, I'm listening to recordings all day long. Mm. Man, it just and I like what I do, but I got to be able to get up and move around, and right, you know, right. and and I'm not like on a treadmill. I'm not one of those dudes, but I mean, you know what I'm saying. Anytime I can make that part of my daily routine, regardless of how small, parking far away from the door um, and walking up a flight of stairs, I mean, I'm going to feel better about myself as a result yeah. of those things. Well, yeah. you're, you're doing something important. You're, you're making something just slightly less convenient for yourself intentionally, though. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's, it's like a mini version of embracing the suck. And, mm-hmm. and it's because you're doing it to yourself. And Arla, this is a story about you that is it's second hand, so I don't even know if this is true, but it sounds like something you would do. <laughs> so uh, one of our friends, Lucas, um, he, he was talking, I, I think, I don't know where he heard this story, or maybe it was Corey, I'm not sure, but that somebody said that they saw you eating left-handed. and That was Lucas. Okay, yeah. it was Lucas. <laughs> and okay, okay, well, so tell the story. Like L- Lucas inquired about that, right? So, so Lucas had broken his arm, and he's had several surgeries for it. So we went to lunch. And we were at this at this Vietnamese restaurant, and we were eating pho, which is awesome, by the way. We like pho. Yeah. But anyway. Is it just noodles? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Right. Yeah. And there's like beef intestine and stuff in there, too. So it's not just noodles. <laughs> but it's really intestine? good. Yeah. <laughs> Unwashed beef right, intestine? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you get a stronger yeah. immune system, yeah. too? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah, we're, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so... So Lucas was eating left-handed and I was eating left-handed too, because I've eaten left-handed for years just because, Mm -hmm. um, to get better at it because I wasn't very good at it initially. So I broke my arm years ago too. And I started eating left-handed and doing other things left-handed and I just kind of never stopped. So, um, anyway, Lucas was proud of himself for eating left-handed and then he realized that I was also, and I'm like, oh yeah, I always eat left-handed just because because it's harder than eating right-handed. <laughs> and so, and I, I don't know I beyond that what the story, well, where well, the story goes. It, well, <laughs> Jeff was going to commiserate with you because uh, what, what do you do with your left hand? Well, I, I don't know. What are we? What are we saying here? What are you setting me up to? <laughs> oh, sorry, that's private. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> not on the podcast, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not on the podcast. Uh, uh, it made enough of an impression on on Lucas that he's. He talked about it to other people, and I mean, like, again, I didn't doubt the story was true for a minute, just because you're a weirdo, and you know, it's one of the <laughs> things I love about you. But it's that same concept, right? It's the same thing as Mace insisting on not taking the elevator, right, just, right. Just, just like these little dumb things. Like, I mean, is your life somehow profoundly better because you're choosing to eat with your left? Like, probably not. But the the fact of the matter is, it's it's an extra thing that you're doing. It's an extra impediment that you're throwing in your way that you consciously have to think through and do those mm. those little baby victories or just things tasks just right, whatever right. it is it, it it sets the stage for uh, bigger deals yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah i think i mean we we definitely grow through adversity and and challenging ourselves to do things that that we're not able to do or not quite comfortable doing mm-hmm. and yeah so even just little things like that like eating left-handed or not taking the elevator or parking far away just Little mini challenges, like you said, can make a profound impact over time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And starting slowly is important. I mean, yeah, I think definitely. If it's new to you, if physical activity is new to you, and, and again, I think if you, you have to be mindful of this as an objective for improvement of mood. If I want my mental well-being to be better, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I think you have to build up your ability kind of gradually. I mean, focus on like, you know, task goals. I mean, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm improving a sports skill or stamina or whatever, rather than getting into like a competition, you know, I'm just, I think the only competition is against yourself. You know, I, was, I, I uh, all the races I ever, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm ever going to win. I think that I will, I do regularly compete against myself though and, you know, do PRs and whatnot. And, but also, I mean, how many times are you writing those things down? I, f- I felt in the last, um, I mean, I'm 36 now, you know, I barely just turned uh, turn 36 in January and I feel now I am in, in a better physical condition than I've ever been in my life, you know, compared to even my earlier days. And a big piece of that was because I didn't keep a whole lot of track of what I was doing. I was just doing it for the sake of doing it, but writing these things down, keeping a record of this and setting goals for myself. One of the, when people start, you know, how do you, they talk about running and stuff and I, and I, and I like this idea, like, didn't you just run a, fi- a 5k? You talked to Cameron Haynes, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Saturday Is he morning. pretty cool guy? 
He was really nice. Yeah. 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 The- he, he, he was wondering a lot about how to address fans that will, I guess fans open up to him about being suicidal and stuff. So he was wanting my, like kind of like my advice on how to approach that or what to say or what not to say. So that was a bulk of our conversation, but wow. yeah, he, he was cool. He, he made time for at least, at least to take a picture and high five everybody that crossed the finish line. That's, That's cool. He was a stud. Well, I like yes. though that you, that you entered into a 5k and I think, okay, so if I'm, if I'm setting up, I'm going to run, you know, I'm going to do this run or, or I'm going to, I'm going to start running. Okay. Well, enter a race that's three months out or something like that. Yeah, why, yeah, definitely. why not set a goal for myself that I'm going to accomplish rather than I'm just doing this to do this, you know, because this is, I think you now have motivation. Um, Plus, you know, you know where you're going. Like a lot of times yeah. people are like, oh, I want to get in better shape, but they don't define <clears throat> yeah, what, does what that, that mean? means. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they never know when they get there, or if they're on the right path or you need to set an end goal or, and, and it's a series of little goals. It's not one big goal. You, you obviously have to take the steps to get there rather than saying, oh, I'm going to lose 100 pounds. You know, what does that mean in a month? What does that mean in two months? Mm-hmm. Um, it can't be just, yeah, I'm going to lose that much weight. But so many people go into fitness just saying, oh, I'm going to get into better shape, but they never define what that no. is. And, and they lose motivation because they've lost their why. They're like, well, why do I want to do this? And, and why am I trying to achieve this goal? Or what is the goal? And if they don't have that, then they just, they give up. You don't have the why? Yeah, if they don't have a why. So I kind of went on a tangent there with the why. But. Well, only it makes sense. <laughs> and, well, and I mean, like it, it, the, the 5K that I just did, like, I, I guess there, there was multiple motivating reasons behind why I did it. Two of them, though, that kind of go hand in hand with what we're talking about is so for one thing, uh, I didn't do it with a friend. I I ran it completely by myself, which is uncomfortable for me. I would rather do something like that with a friend, but I chose not to. You know, I mean, if if Justin or Mace wanted to have accompanied me like that, have been cool. But I I was going to do it anyway. And then like I'm a sissy about my sleep. I like getting a lot of sleep. That's where I was. And right. And well, and I mean, (laughs) like there's something about. So, I mean, it. It, it was 45 minutes from my house uh, in Salt Lake, and the race started at 7 a.m. And so for me, that's not something I'm used to doing. So making myself get up, knowing that no other friends are going to be there, and, and making myself run because I know how this race coming up eventually, is it, it's just sort of a piece of mental training. Like a 5K for me is nothing. That's three miles. That's whatever. you know. So it, was, it wasn't so much the distance that helped me train. It was making my, it's putting myself into a situation that it ended up being fun, but – W- waking up wasn't and right, right. going out there and not knowing anybody that wasn't fun either well a big core yes. of this is it breaks down to doing something i don't want to do or doing or pushing myself to do something maybe i don't want to do in the moment based on how i think i'm going to feel about it later yeah I, it, this right. hits me all the time mm-hmm. like it's, it's i usually go in and out of workout routines but i've worked out pretty regularly 15 years more than 15 years jeff was one of the people that actually originally got me into working out i did but yeah oh nice just because you're awesome and it rubbed off on me. No, but, uh, <laughs> we, that's a whole other podcast. But uh, the whole thing for me is I, I I don't think in all that time I've ever had one time I've went to the gym where after I was like, yeah, I really wish I didn't go. That, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like you're always glad you went. I always think a bad workout is better than no workout. And, and anytime I'll be driving there, I'll be kind of like dozing off. I'm like, oh, my God, I really don't want to go. Almost as soon as I'm in the parking lot, I'm like, okay, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I made it. And I never regret mm-hmm. that. But I, sure. I definitely have regretted times where I was like, eh, screw it. I'm just going to get a pizza and watch TV. You know what's and fascinating about yeah. exactly. You know what's fascinating about that, too, though? And this is something I, pe- I don't think people know. And you said that really well was um, doing the right thing when the right thing is hard to do. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you are forcing yourself to activate a part of your brain that is the most rational and the part of your brain that's going to think through these things in a, in a much better way. If you think about like the common signs of stress, right? We're, we're talking about sweating, loss of appetite, increased blood pressure, anything that invokes the fight or flight response, the part of our brain that, that we don't want making rational decisions because it's going to make really shitty decisions, right? Uh, uh, people think that um, you might evoke that because you were, it's totally not true. I mean, when I'm, when I have to talk myself through this, this workout, like kind of like the embrace the suck, when you, when you brought that up I, it made me think of um my last iron man was in, when i was in um colorado and my first real big open water swim and i went so far away from where i was supposed to go and i wanted to quit almost immediately because of how far out i was and i just and part and i had to get a grip and calm down for a second and really talk myself through man are you really gonna quit on us on the swim bro you're not even a mile in yet 
and you got you know however many hundreds of miles to go right. before you're done with this race, you're gonna quit on the on the swim. Well, and that must got, have been crushing motivationally for you to like because you trained your ass off for that race. Right, you, yeah. you were you were planning on hitting a PR, right? And so when you found yourself off course, you probably knew right then you weren't gonna hit your PR. Maybe not because my swim is not my strong suit at all by any stretch. And how, and how did you get yourself talked into not quitting? Um, you know, it was really simple. There was a, it, it was a lot of it. the people at Red Ironman's are really cool. So there was a, if you're under water, you're under, you can't see anything in a lake. It's just dirty water. I mean, it's, it's not dirty, but it's just lake water, right? So I'm swimming and you don't have lines and you usually spot something. And I was, um, when I got started, I was up with the, the pros, which you're not supposed to do. And it was a mistake because the water was really warm. So some of the pros were still in their wetsuits. I'm not a great swimmer, so I still will wear a wetsuit. And I didn't know they were mixed in. Normally I just wait for them. Anyway, I got going and I tried to swim really hard so I could get away from them because they're kicking you and elbowing you and all this other stuff. And I got going out there and you hear, you can hear jet skis because people, they don't want anybody to drown. So they have jet skis and they have canoes and they have, you know, people on these boards and everything out there trying to make sure everybody's safe. And I could hear a jet ski coming really close to me. So I popped up and, and he, you know, the guy's like, he's like, you're a little bit left. And I looked up and I was like, oh my God. And I looked back and the buoys were so far away. Oh. And, and I started to, um, you know, and he could tell I was stressed out and, um, and this was a young kid. He was like probably 20, maybe, I mean, you know, young, long, young twenties. And, and he just said, he's all, he's all, man, you, you trained way too hard to quit right now. And I was mm-hmm. like, Oh wow. Like, you know, this guy doesn't know me. He probably doesn't care about me. And, and he's out here on a jet ski, you know, spending his time volunteering for this encouraging me to go. I was like, I'm going, I'm going, that's all I'm going to do. Just something as simple as that, you know? And I, and I got going back into this and I was like, you're right. I'm not quitting. And then I just gave, I said, screw my PR. I mean, who who cares at that point? You know, you finish for the, for the satisfaction of finishing. Yeah. I actually got disqualified from that race. <laughs> oh, you did? <laughs> because I carried my son across the finish line. Oh, dude. Oh, yeah. Man. What a mess of a race. I know. Yeah. They're all, you got so the you, rules clearly state, Mr. Wood. You can't, I'm like, come on, son. So like, your first says, mile, that helped you. If you could remove your first mile of that race and your last mile, it'd have been great. <laughs> yeah. I didn't carry, I didn't carry my son for a mile, uh, but maybe yeah, 10 feet, but yeah. <laughs> I was really tired you got DQ'd at that point. That. Yeah, um, it's it it worth it. it but I, it. but yeah. I think like uh, any time that I can coach my brain into working um, that part of it, the, the 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 you know, so just to get technical here, our prefrontal cortex doing the right thing when the right thing is difficult to do, even when that means I'm pushing myself through difficult physical activity when I'm incredibly tired, um, because I know it's the right thing to do. Same thing with depression. I mean, the number one thing I try to tell people with depression, you're halfway, if not, I mean, 75% of the way there. If you just go do stuff, just Mm -hmm. go get out of your house and be Mm -hmm. physically active. And I know it doesn't feel like you want to do it. I know you don't, but you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And again, I'm activating that part of my brain that's really going to push me through that. And it's not just a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, you are really coaching your brain to think through difficult situations. Well, and, and the routine that happens to me every time. So I usually will be in a pretty good routine for a little bit workout wise. And I'll get lazy or work will get crazy and I'll kind of slack off, which is what happened, you know. I, I get. I guess I uh, justify being able to do it every holidays because I want to quote unquote eat good food, but I also stop working out. Anyways, when I want to get back into it, though, it sounds horrible every time. It sounds like I, there's a part of me that's like, you got to get back in, dude. You got to get going. You got to get going. And I won't usually think, okay, starting Monday, you're going to go six days a week. You're going to do this plan. I usually will just say, go once this week, go twice this week, just get the ball rolling. Yeah. And I make myself go. And usually after a couple of weeks, it's to the point where I am, like where I'm at now is more like, I think about it all day. Like I'm excited. Like, whoa, where can I get in the next one? But I know if I push through those initial few times, I'll be to that point. I know once I go through the hoops a little bit and force myself, I'll actually be excited about it for a long time. But you, but you set the bar at, I'm going to make it twice this week. Yeah. You set the bar there. Yeah. And, that, and that makes it possible yeah. to add progressively. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And then once I'm in the routine, I get to that point where I'm like, okay, this is where I wanted to be. And I'm excited about it. And I ride that out as long as that'll go. Yeah. Well, and it'll progress. Like that's the whole thing. And so I think going back to kind of how we initially started this podcast was you eventually are going to prove yourself um, a, a new potential every single time. You'll be right, able to push right. past this. The I like the starting slow piece um, because so many people will say that. You know, I'm like <laughs> I, I, I talked to um, 
I was talking to this one guy I was um mm, I won't say his name anyway. He, he he just was calm. I mean, he you know he did regular forty hours a week, and he's ah oh, man, I just can't find the time. And I was like, dude, I work like eighty hours a week, and I make sure I go to the gym, and like no matter what, like you know, I, I can't make the time. Well, well, you you can. I promise you can. You can make the time. We make up these decisions. It's hard in our lives. to, but it is hard yeah. to. But we make up these. We make up these. I have to get eight, eight hours of sleep. Right, Jeff. I, <laughs> I, 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 I have to. Get, I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do this. And so then I said, I will start making excuses. I'm, oh, I'm going to start on Monday. No, you're not. You're not going to start on Monday. I mean, if I just set these miniature goals for myself and allow myself to uh, to progress over time, naturally you're going to. I mean, you're going to keep proving yourself a new potential. I mean, that's all there. It, it just. And I don't think anybody really ever. I mean, ever really gets there. And this is. I mean, you know, it's just like uh, I'm watching all the Winter Olympics right now. Everybody's like sitting. There's all these new records every year. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. When are we gonna like be able right. to run as fast as cars? You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although yeah. Winter Olympics is just people going down hills really fast, but still. <laughs> I, well, I I think that at one point in time, the it God, who was it that broke the four minute mile the first time? Roger Bannister. Yeah, Bannister. So I mean, a lot of people are familiar with that, but if you're not, um, the the four minute mile at one point in time was considered to be impossible. Un, un, yeah, impossible. Mm-hmm. Human beings can't physically make their bodies do that. And then Roger Bannister did it, and then like a million other people did it. Right, Maybe right. not a million, but uh, it, like the that, With, that within the first year, there were a bunch of people that also right. did it. Mm-hmm. And prior and prior to then, prior to then, nobody had done it. Nobody. nobody. Everybody was convinced that the human body was not capable of doing right, that. Right. So Bannister did it, and then everybody started doing it. And I, 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 and. And you know know what was crazy about that, though? What was that? Was that he, I don't know where you're going with this, but the interesting thing about that was he did not do any type of crazy training regimen either. It's not like he, like, did any revolutionary, it's, you know, we're not talking about um, Dolph Lundgren in Rocky IV, you know, running all this technological stuff and juicing himself to the tits and steroids and everything. Like, he, all he did was think it was possible. That's it. That's really all he did Mm -hmm. as far as as working through this, and he was able to accomplish that. Dude, it's the secret. (laughs) (laughs) No. That's that's no. the take home lesson. Okay, close the podcast. We're done. Don't, the secret. Follow no, the secret. No. Don't do that. <laughs> Who's the fastest? Was it was it that ran the fastest speed wise? Was it Usain Bolt? Or, or well, that's well, yeah for the hundred mile meter per dash. hour. Well, well, for the hundred meter dash, I think that ten seconds for her was con- considered the right, threshold. Right. You know, and I think Usain Bolt. You'd have to look it up. But he ran he ran like nine point five eight or nine point six nine. I think is the. I think he hit nine point five something. Did he really? Oh I yeah, think this, so. yeah this, oh yeah yeah. So this was in in Beijing in Beijing. I think he ran nine. Yes, yeah, they, nine they clocked him at twenty eight miles an hour in the hundred meter sprint. Jeez. What was his time? I don't know. I'd have to double check. But Go, going 20, back that's, to the, that's crazy. Twenty eight miles. Going an hour. back to the Dolph Lundgren, and this is a little bit of a tangent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so about Usain Bolt, how how there's people that do everything exactly like they're supposed to do, and they and all the latest technology and all that, and the, and. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Usain Bolt is when he was in China for the Beijing Olympics, he estimates he ate like a thousand chicken nuggets. Like he was eating a hundred <laughs> chicken nuggets mm-hmm. a day. And that's what he was breaking world records on that's is chicken awesome. nuggets. This isn't and what Mace just, needs to hear, man. It's the mind more than the body. I mean, they're, they're both important, but you can accomplish well, it was, crazy yeah. things without doing everything right. It, it was just like uh, Mace uh, fuels his eye, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Pe- peanut butter M and M's and Coke yeah. Zero and Coke Zero. <laughs> well, that was it was like uh, that Courtney Courtney DeWalter that oh, Joe Rogan dude. had on her pod, on yeah. his podcast, dude. And she's he's all well, what, what's your what you so she she ran the Moab two hundred. It was oh, two hundred thirty how two hundred thirty eight miles I think right. And she ran I mean and she ran it. She beat the next so she's the overall winner. Meaning she beat all the dudes and. And then the next closest guy was 20 miles away from her. And, yeah, not and really Rogan good. asked her, he's like, well, what's your, what's your diet like? And I'm sure he was looking for some like ketogenic nonsense or something, but she just <laughs> said, I don't know, nachos, beer, you know, like yeah, candy. Yeah. Well, like, <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> well, what's his I'm vindicated. <laughs> what's his Hard name that was on with. Rogan's podcast a while back? That Wim Hof guy. Where yeah, he yeah, just yeah, does yeah, crazy man. stuff. Yeah. Without like really even training for it or whatever. He ran a, marathon and freezing temperatures where like wearing just shorts like right, no shoes right. anything just, just crazy stuff yeah he hiked everest didn't he 
Yes, I think yeah, he did. I believe so. Or like barefoot or something. Yeah, and just short, <laughs> yeah. it's always shorts, I guess. But yeah, yeah. He, he's he's he was one that was huge on that. Just first mm. off, what do you tell yourself you can do? Because yeah, we can definitely. Limit We're capable ourselves. of a lot more oh, than yeah. what we think we are, right. and our threshold for discomfort is way more than what we want to consider it. You know, I, and our list might be more your world, but I, I, there's some famous workout dude that that talks about kind of the the, the levels of pain that people are willing to push themselves to and how most people most people don't scratch the surface of discomfort even let Mm -hmm. alone you know pain uh dr davis told me about this guy oh yeah yeah but uh, i don't know uh ultimately whether we're talking about uh roger bannister or usain bolt i mean i'll probably never run a four minute mile or a nine point whatever second hundred meter dash in fact I, i well, there's, there, there are physical limitations. I also will never tap dance in the sun probably, you know, but like there's that the, I'm certainly more capable as is everybody here than, than we're any one of the four of us is currently, you know, we're capable of more and we don't. And right, right. if you're listening to this and you've n- never really given much thought to working out or exercise, and that starts with a 10 minute walk tonight, like, you know what, go do it. Yeah. And speaking of capable of being more, March first, battle tested. Yeah, <laughs> that's right? right. That's right. That yep. yeah, in, embracing the suck. Yes. Like no matter how far you are behind on that, now that's going to be the truth. So, so if you listen to this and that book doesn't drop on March first, everything everything we said is bullshit up to this point, right? Yeah, it's all it's true. false. Yeah, true. everything <laughs> yeah. is false. If Arlo does not have that book, that's true. <laughs> everything he said was total lies, yep. lies and deceit. And so you'll leave a negative comment on his Facebook page, which is what? Perfect. Uh, what's, what's your, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. How, do, how yeah. do people get a hold of you, man, if yeah. they're interested in competitive edge or your books or anything else? So there, there's quite a few ways, actually. So uh, on Facebook, we have a battle-tested page, battle-tested book. And then my personal Facebook page, you can certainly contact me through that also, just Arlo Gagastein. Mm-hmm. And I don't. You have, have to spell that one out. Okay, yeah. it's A R L O, Arlo, and then Gagastein G A G E S T E I N, and then awesome. we also have uh, websites both for the book and for my gym: competitiveedgefitness.com, and then battletestedbook.com. Are you guys on MySpace too? No, we're not. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> good. No good. one's good. no one's gonna look it up. That was a test. Yeah. yeah. That was yeah, we were not gonna post this if you said yes. So <laughs> Well thanks for coming on, man. Oh absolutely. We'll have to have you thanks again. for having me. Yeah. yeah. So okay, great. Awesome. Alrighty, folks, that's a wrap on episode 16 of the Gorilla Social Work Podcast. We want to thank you for tuning in. We also want to thank Arlo for coming on the show. Be sure to check out his book coming out here, Battle Tested. And also we put some information about Competitive Edge Fitness and the, the details for the show. We'll also have that posted up. Go check that out. And that'll just be a wrap for today. Make sure you check us out on all the social work websites, Facebook, Instagram, all that jazz. It's Gorilla Social Work, G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A, Gorilla Social Work. And we will be back next week with episode... Episode 17.